Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sydney, and if you are new here, this is just a place where we can talk about true crime, spooky scary stories, and today I've got kind of a weird one for you. So I was talking to my partner, as one does, and he had just watched the Polar Express for the first time in a really long time, and we started talking about the animation style and how it's a little bit unsettling right and that got me thinking about the uncanny valley and so today we are going to do a deep dive into what is exactly the uncanny valley how it makes us as human beings feel and i'm also going to give a bunch of examples so feel free to hunker down grab a little snack and let's talk about the uncanny valley so i think the best place to start is the origin of the uncanny valley who created this topic how did it become popular? So let's jump right into it. So a roboticist from Japan named Masahiro Mori actually came up with the concept of the Valley of Eeriness in 1978. He was very much at the forefront of creating different robots and he wanted to create a robot that had a very human-like appearance. So as he was researching creating a robot that looked like a human, he realized that people were attracted to robots that looked like them or looked human. But at a certain point, the humanness of the robot began to scare people. Once the robot began to look again, a little bit less human, it became attractive again to humans. So it quite literally created a valley. And I'm gonna include some pictures so it kind of makes more sense because it, it is a little bit of a strange and abstract concept. So now that we understand kind of where the uncanny valley came from, let's talk about why people think that we as humans have this kind of uncanny valley feeling. So some people think that when we see something that we can't quite identify as being human, we start to feel uneasy. Others think that it's kind of a combination between mismatching elements. Like maybe we can understand that the eyes of a robot are human or very human-like, but the skin texture is a little wrong and the elements kind of just don't click together and our brains recognize this and don't like it or we feel some sort of fear towards it. And a good example of this would be like seeing a robot with a human voice or seeing a human with a robot voice. It just, our brains can't really grasp it. Another theory is that our brains can't decide what category to put things that are uncanny valley in. For example, if we see a robot that looks very much like a human, our brain kind of gets confused. Should we put it in a human? Like, should we identify it as a human or should we identify it as a machine? What I think is the most creepy theory though is that our brains understand that we should be scared of things that can A, carry disease or B, cause us some sort of harm. So our brain recognizes things in the uncanny valley as one of these things, like this thing that's uncanny might cause me harm or disease because it doesn't quite look right. There was a study in 2019 that was actually made to try to understand how our brains work when we see something uncanny. 21 different subjects were given MRIs while they were shown different images. These pictures were a conglomeration of different things, some being humans, some being robots, and some being pictures of robots that look like humans, humans that look like robots, that kind of thing. The subjects were then asked to rate these pictures on their humanness and likableness. The second part of this test was showing the same you know, different pictures and asking the subjects, which of these images or which one of these people would you like to receive a gift from the most? Then using the subject's answers, the researchers were able to tell which images were the most uncanny or caused the most sense of unease. By looking at the brain activity of the subjects during the test, researchers were able to see that during these tasks, the parts of the brain that were most active were ones that were responsive to social cues and facial expressions. And these parts of the brain were more lit up when they were looking at human-like images. Ones that weren't uncanny were just human. That part of the brain was much more active. Additionally, when responding to the question about receiving a gift, the amygdala of the subjects lit up much more when they were asked about receiving a gift from a human 
or a human-like image. So this study basically just confirmed what Mori discovered in the 1970s, right? That people responded more to things that looked like them, that acted like them. So now that we understand the uncanny valley, I thought it would just be fun to look at a bunch of different images from all across the internet, all across the world, to just be freaked out about the uncanny valley because there's something so darn creepy about it. So first we're gonna start out by talking about different examples of robots that fall into the category of the uncanny. So our first robot is called CB2. So this robot was actually just created to mirror the physical and mental state of a two-year-old. And even its name, CB2, kind of explains its purpose, right? It stands for child with biometric body. So CB2. This robot has two cameras in its eyes, two microphones in its ears, and 197 different tactical sensors around its body. What I find creepy about this robot, besides the obvious its looks are absolutely terrifying, to me anyway, the thing that freaks me out is that they built this robot in order to learn. Much like a regular two-year-old child, this robot has actually learned to walk with the aid of its air pressurized muscles in its legs. So do with that information what you want. <laughs> Coming out in 2010, Telenoid R1 is straight out of my nightmares. Developed by Hiroshi Ishiguro, this robot was made to be basically a very high-tech video conference robot. This technology allows its user to feel like they are in the same room as the person they are chatting with online. This is done by using different cameras and microphones to track the caller's movement, and then the robot can then mimic these movements and sounds. This robot was designed to be ambiguous and emulate all different genders and ages, which is partially why it looks like that. This concept is very cool actually because it has lots of different types of utilizations. It's been used in nursing homes to help elderly people communicate and just have sort of that feeling of like touch. It also has been used to teach new languages, which is really cool. Sorry now. Ah, Maria, come in, sir. Oh no, in English, please. I'm sorry. Please be on time from now on. It's a cool concept, and it's proven to work. However, why he look like that? Why he face do that? The last robot we're gonna be talking about was also created by Ishiguro and it's called Gemini High. So this robot was designed and developed to look exactly like its creator, Ishiguro, and it does a pretty good job besides the fact that it's just not human and it's very uncanny, especially when you see pictures of it that are like side to side like this one here. Made in 2006, Geminoid, which is of course from the word Gemini, meaning twins, was actually a case study that Ishiguro did to try to discover the meaning of being human. And this robot can make very convincing movements and facial expressions, which I think is part of the reason why it's so creepy. ATR to Osaka Daigaku no Ishiguro desu. Konnichiwa. Watashi wa Ishiguro no Android, Geminoid HI1 desu. 2006 nen ni umaremashita. So next we're going to be talking about facial reconstruction and more specifically how it's used in police sketches. Now you might be thinking like what's the point of this? But if you haven't seen some of these police sketches just hold on to your horses okay because some of these are just extremely uncanny. So first off we're going to be talking about Burka Girl. So in 2011 there was an archaeologist and a sculptor and his name was Oscar Nielsen. And he decided to make a full body reconstruction of a young girl that had died over 1,000 years ago in the Burka region of Sweden. She appeared to have died when she was about six years old and her body was discovered in 1876. This reconstruction brings to life what a child during that period of time would have maybe looked like. And it's amazing when you think about it, how much we can glean from something that happened so long ago. Unfortunately though, this project is kind of overshadowed by how uncanny this reconstruction looks. To me personally, it's something about her eyes and lips that just don't quite look right and give her kind of this 
creepy vibe, which is sad because it was a really great project. Next, we're going to be talking about the case of Laura Simonson, as well as her police sketch that ultimately helped identify her. So in 2013, a woman was found stuffed inside of a suitcase along a Wisconsin highway. Her body was decomposed beyond the point of recognition. However, they were able to make a reconstruction of her face based on the features that they were able to pick out. They hoped that kind of exaggerating these facial features would help somebody realize that this was their loved one. And this actually worked. The family of 37-year-old Laura Simonson came forward because of this sketch and were able to identify their daughter. Laura had been missing for about seven months when the family came forward to identify her. By 2017, they had found the person that had committed not only Laura's murder, but the murder of another woman as well. And this person was former police officer Stephen Zellett. Stephen was sentenced to 25 years in prison after he finished his other sentence, which was 35 years. So he was serving a total of 60 years in prison. Well, this police sketch was absolutely vital in figuring out who Laura Simonson was and identifying her murderer. I'm not gonna lie, this sketch is, is really scary. It's maybe one of the most uncanny valley things I've ever seen. You may actually recognize this sketch as it's sometimes used in different analog horror stories as well as creepypastas. Our last little entry, and I guess you could call this a true crime uncanny valley, is the case of Selena Delgado Lopez. Throughout the 90s and 2000s, there was a Mexican channel called Channel 5, and they often ran this segment called Service of the Community. This series featured missing people, their pictures, and just little bits of information about them. One of the people that was featured in almost every one of these segments was a young girl named Selena Delgado Lopez who went missing in 2000, according to the show. This in and of itself was very strange because they always showed the same low resolution photo, had almost the exact same information, but there was never any new leads and she was always in the segments. It was just a little bit strange. Lopez, de 18 años, extravió el 22 de abril en la delegación Álvaro Obregón. To make things even more strange, Channel 5 went through this little phase in 2020 where they would just post all these random creepy things on their Twitter just to quickly take it down later. One of these posts actually mentioned Celine Delgado Lopez, which of course led people to start theorizing about who this woman was. At this point, quite a few YouTubers became interested in Selena Delgado and actually uncovered that she was not a real person. And since then, a lot of YouTubers have actually covered Selena's case and some have uncovered and theorized that she is not actually a real person. For example, in 2021, Florencia Dreams made a video detailing how when they matched up different images of fictional things to Selena Delgado's face, it showed that her facial features were very much not human. Nexpo also covered this case in great detail and I highly suggest going to watch his video if you want more information about it because he lays it out very nicely. It appears that the community following this case has mixed feelings about whether Selena Delgado is real or not. I think that her photo definitely does fall within the uncanny valley, although it is on that edge where like, I can see how it could be an actual picture, how it could be human. I'm just not really sure. It's always something about the eyes and the mouth that to me make it very uncanny and she does have a little bit of that in her picture. That being said, I am a little hesitant to jump on the bandwagon that her photo isn't real because if this is a truly unsolved case, if she is truly missing, I don't want to discredit that. It is a little bit weird and we will move on. <laughs> All right, moving right along, we are going to be looking at a few different movies that fall into the category of the uncanny. And I feel like it wouldn't be right if we didn't talk about the Polar Express to start off with. I think most, if not all of us, have seen the 2004 classic The Polar Express at least one time during the holidays. Well, this is a heartwarming story of faith and belief, oh lord, is it scary. <laughs> I think the reason it is so very uncanny is because it was the first movie to fully use motion capture, which is a big deal. And I don't want to discredit that, like that is a huge feat and it 
definitely influenced a lot of other movies down the road like Beowulf and Tintin and things like that. Like it is, for its time, it's incredibly animated. And the opinion that this movie is very creepy, it didn't start once the movie had been out for a while. When it came out in 2004, sources like CNN said that the characters had dead and soulless eyes, which I think is just kind of funny. <laughs> that like right when they came out, they're like, no, evil, evil Christmas movie, get away Satan. I think this is partially because motion capture was not popular in the early 2000s because it just wasn't that good. And people were used to like cute animations and very cartoony and cute. And this was very lifelike but not lifelike enough. That being said, I think people get used to the uncanniness as they watch the movie. Like by the end, you're like, hot, hot, oh, we got it, hot, hot. You know, like you're vibing with the music, you're vibing with hearing the Christmas bell. Plus Tom Hanks, he carries that movie. He's like almost every adult character. Like he does almost all the voice acting for them. I don't know. Although I hate it, and the animation's scary, I will always be watching the Polar Express every Christmas. So while I was researching, Almost every place I looked, people were talking about this movie and how uncanny it was. And that is Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. This movie came out before the Polar Express in July of 2001, and it was very advanced for its time. CGI was just starting to gain traction, and this $70 million project was groundbreaking for the time. So while they animated some parts of the characters, some parts of their characteristics, almost the entirety of the film was done in motion capture. The production company Squaresoft put so much time and energy and effort into this project that it was ultimately its downfall. When the movie finally did come out, it did not do well. And some people actually blame the movie's misfortune on the Uncanny Valley. The characters have kind of the same flaws that they do in the Polar Express where like their reactions are a little bit off and their facial features are just not quite right. And it makes for a really creepy movie. And how about the fact that I was sent there on a job and you wouldn't even see me? I was probably helping Dr. Sid collect spirit waves. Well, now I know. So I'm sorry. Well, me too. So we're both sorry. We're going to move on and we're just going to talk about video games. And I just picked one out of the bunch because I personally don't play a lot of video games, but I do have personal experience with this one. So I felt the most comfortable talking about the one that I know, obviously, but I'm sure that there are countless others. So as I was playing this game, I kept thinking that the characters were very creepy. And that was the game Until Dawn. This 2015 game follows the players as they are trapped on a snowy mountainside in the midst of a killer. The plot and the voice acting, in my opinion, is amazing. I really liked the game. The problem is, is they use motion capture. And although it is so much better than some of our earlier films that we were talking about, it's still just a little bit creepy. And I don't know if it's because like, for example, I know what Remy Malek's face looks like in real life. So seeing it in a game is a little bit creepy. And I debated even bringing video games into this because I know how much time and effort it takes to make a game and to make a game look as amazing as you know, Undell Dawn looked for its time. Like, I think that video games, I cut a bit more slack because it is really hard to animate a game. But either way, playing that game gave me so much uncanny valley. And last but certainly not least, I just kind of wanted to play a little reel of 2000s commercials because I was having nostalgia, right? I was watching a streamer watch 2000s commercials and I was like holy shit there are so many different commercials that used like CGI and stuff but it was horrible and it nightmare fuel nightmare fuel so roll the tape Double sandwich. Oi, oi, oi! Punky chips ahoy! Oi, oi, oi! No, no, no! Not punky! Chunky! Chunky chips ahoy! Anyways, I just kind of wanted to end off on that fun little note. I hope that you guys enjoyed experiencing the uncanny valley with me. If you enjoyed 
feel free to like and subscribe as we are nearing closer to halloween i do just want to say that i hope you guys are enjoying your spooky season and are enjoying the uploads i hope to have one more spooky spectacular video for you guys before halloween but anyway i hope you guys have a great day enjoy the fall weather and keep being the bad bitches that you are bye guys Thank you.